Julian Carr, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, man. Honor to be on. It's yeah, it's great to have you. And as a admirer of yours, though, we've never really spoken. Uh, I've been looking forward to this conversation. I think there's so much good stuff to talk about. And uh, yeah, I just think that you can offer so much as to how to align, you know, what you love to do with you, with what you actually do professionally. There's so many people out there that, that know what they love, but have a hard time sort of figuring out how to make ends meet. And you've been so successful in doing so. And I'm hoping you can maybe leave me with uh, some advice on that front too, as I start to think about all these things professionally as well. But this is the first time we've ever spoken. And uh, I think it would be good to just kind of start things in the generic place with just a general introduction to who you are. Like, how how do you describe yourself to somebody who you're just meeting just as a way of saying hello to the audience? (laughs) Well, thanks. And before I do that, just uh, it's reciprocal. It's an honor to be chatting with you, and I've been a big fan of what you're doing. Um, so my name is Julian Carr, a uh, professional skier, and um, you know I founded Cirque Series, and I have a few other businesses that I've done in the past and currently doing. But uh, as far as what we're going to probably be chatting mostly today, uh, obviously Cirque Series has been a major, major passion of mine um, since I started that in 2015. So how did it all begin for you, though? I mean, what's your origin story? Where are you from? Uh, So I grew up in Salt Lake City, Utah, and I actually didn't start skiing until eighth grade. Um, And, you know, obviously really fell in love with skiing. And, you know, as anyone that spends a lot of time on skis, uh, you're in the high alpine a lot. And um, when you ski, you know, um, you know, people ask me what kind of skiing. I usually just say extreme skiing. And that means you're going up ridges, you're going up to peaks, you're finding, you know, the steepest, most interesting terrain with the most features. Uh, And typically to avoid avalanche terrain, you're going uh, straight up. So usually, um, you know, I'm in the high alpine with a small group of people working on a project or out for a day of recreation. But usually, you know, it's considerable danger you need to mitigate. And it's a pretty special environment that you get to share with such few people. And obviously it's quite magical. And that kind of, uh, you know, real long story short, it's like the ability for me to share those sacred spaces uh, in the summer with the Cirque Series and my knowledge and my background and kind of my skill set of being fluent in the high alpine is, you know, kind of lent me to being able to architect these courses that you know, are short and challenging. Um, and that's kind of the whole point for me, because that's the way I go ski is I want to get up in a short fashion in the safest way possible to the coolest, highest places and ski down them. So come summertime, um, I'm so used to hiking all those types of ridges and those interesting high alpine places that I can kind of have a gauge on, you know, where, where's that fine line of approachable uh, for the beginner, but still obviously really challenging for pros that still enjoy it. Um, and, and be able to put something together like that, just with a nice feel to it. It's funny. I mean, it makes perfect sense now because the Cirque series is basically extreme skiing for trail running, right? And (laughs) you coming from an extreme skiing background, it makes perfect sense as to how you orient those courses. So when you got into skiing as an eighth grader, did you immediately think like, I want to do this professionally. Did you fall in love with it in that way? And and how did it ultimately evolve into it becoming more of a, of a job than just a passion or a side hustle? Well, you know, throughout high school, I was just trying to go as much as I could um, and really, you know, kept falling in love with it. And then kind of end of high school, first year of college, you know, I was consuming all the magazines, movies, And, you know, I I felt like I could do those things, uh, that I could hang with the people that were in the movies and the magazines. So, you know, that was my first kind of real awareness of what it took to be, you know, a professional skier. Uh, and that's where I think things get interesting with a lot of people that want to go down that path is that, you know, that's half the term professional skier. So to be a professional, you have to really understand your role as a storyteller uh, and to represent these brands and what they're looking for from you. And luckily I found that I enjoyed that. And so I found some success in finding sponsors right out of the gate because I found that 
I just had a natural way to understand and interpret what they were looking for. And Mm -hmm. I saw the landscape of movies and magazines and competitions as like distribution. So I, I was able to, you know, seek out relationships and friendships with those distributors um, and get plugged in. Um, so that way I could prove my value to the sponsors and obviously provide analytics, have good communication, be a professional. Uh, I enjoyed that. And I think that's something that a lot of really good athletes, skiing or otherwise, get tripped up on. Uh, they might have an amazing skill set, but they're very unprofessional or don't quite understand uh, how much time you have to spend on the professional side. So they might show up for a year or two on the scene and do some incredible things. But at the end of the day, they're not going to get called back by photographers or companies or film uh, crews that need somewhere reliable. They can get up for sunrise. They know they're going to be there. They know they're going to deliver and all the follow through and all the computer stuff. So luckily I found I was just as good, if not, you know, better at the, professional side and that's how I you know had a 15 plus 15 plus year career and, and, and still going and um did you find that that was sort of your differentiator where if you were on an equal footing with another skier just the the hustle and consideration that you put into the professional side of things and your ability to build relationships was sort of what helped you to to build more of a career within it rather than, you know, just kind of doing it because it was the thing to do or the thing that you like to do, but to actually like make it more of a profession. Absolutely. I think that's what keeps me around. Um, uh, I think this is important just because like in all outdoor sports, right? Like it's unusual for athletes to not have kind of a side hustle that they use to help make ends meet. And you've been so good at, you know, establishing yourself and building a great reputation as an athlete, but then using that athlete status and those relationships to then build businesses around that core nucleus of your athletic life. And so I think it's a really important point to make to younger athletes in the sport is to not forget that professional word when they consider their, their career. It's not just about like in trail running, it's not just about the course records and the podium performances, right? It's like, it is about building those relationships and getting the distribution and understanding what sponsors are looking for and delivering against it, isn't it? Totally. And, you know, the landscape has evolved and continues to evolve. Um, When I first got my career going as a skier, all the platforms were kind of traditional media. And now, obviously, fast forward 15 years, uh, so much of it is, um, you know, social media to just kind of self-generated projects. So it's evolved quite a bit. There's still obviously traditional media, but it's not like the major pillars of what makes you relevant. Um, So that's what's so interesting is you have to be adaptive. You have to evolve because there's been so many amazing athletes that were very uh, relevant on the traditional platforms. And as as that shifted, uh, they didn't find any passion or understanding or, you know, any kind of like eagerness to understand how it was evolving. And so they kind of faded away and, you know, obviously RIP to like Yuli Steck, but he's a good example. Yeah. He, you know, one of the most, he is one of the most famous alpinists and he was plugged in in every type of project you can imagine and holds all kinds of Alpine records. And, you know, he didn't do anything to plug himself into the landscape and the media as it evolved. And he uh, said that quite a few times later on in his career that he was pretty jaded, that he was getting less sponsor support, less opportunities Um, because he wasn't adapting to the social media and and the self-starting like Mm. episodes or whatever you want to say. I mean, obviously he might be uh, a strange example, but I just, you know, there's lots of others. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a, it's a good point and a good thing for, for people to consider that if you do want to align your passion with your profession, there's a lot of career work that goes into it. You know, it's not anymore. It's not about 
getting a picture published in a magazine and building your career that way. You do have to put a lot more hustle into getting yourself out there. And yeah, I mean, some people, it does come off as being very self-congratulatory or self-promotional to the point where it makes some people uncomfortable, but there's a fine line. And when it is authentic, people resonate with it so much. And that's why you know, we can point to so many athletes across the outdoor industry who've done it so well and have built great careers for themselves. I think you're a great example of it. While we're on the subject of, you know, skiing evolving and outdoor sports evolving, you know, I've been a longtime skier myself and an observer of professional skiing. And I think you very much represent sort of like the, you know, put it all on the line type attitude in the sport. So, you know, maybe I'll, I'll use that as a way of setting up, you know, some of your world records and let you sort of talk through it. But I think it's representative of a point of just like the sport progressing so much during your time within it to the point where you're almost forced to kind of put your physical health on the line and sort of confront mortality much so more so than trail runners do in order to build a career with skiing. Any, uh, comments on that and maybe introduce some of your accomplishments as a professional skier. Sure. So, you know, I grew up, uh, like I said, born in Salt Lake City, Utah and spent countless weekends camping, uh, going to big, big hiking missions with my dad in the Uenas or Southern Utah looking for petroglyphs and really found a love for, you know, finding a breath, finding a rhythm and adventuring. Um, and really fell in love with uh, being out there. And so, you know, started skiing in eighth grade and obviously you can get around and the mountains a lot quicker on skis. I think it's the only sport you go as fast as you do without the use of an engine. So things get really interesting, obviously dangerous very quickly uh, when you combine the speeds that you're going, the type of terrain you're in, and then obviously avalanches as well. So you know, a lot of icons in this in skiing have died. A lot of people uh, die in avalanches, etc. So, you know, the love factor of what I've always said is you have to really balance your um, your vision with your abilities and like the terrain and and safety. You know, because a lot of people they it's really easy in skiing and I guess any sport, but your vision can exceed your abilities quickly. Uh, and obviously that's when you run into problems, whether it's safety or abilities. Um, and, you know, throughout my career, uh, you know, I can kind of trace it back to when I used to do tons of gymnastics when I was little, I loved the foam pit and being in Utah where, you know, tons and tons of powder, uh, falls in eighth, ninth grade, I started skiing a lot and I, you know, understood and felt deep powder. Uh, for the first few times, um, for anyone that has, you know, uh, it's pretty magical. It's, it's, it's a miracle and it's not much different than jumping into a foam pit. Yeah. Uh, so the ability over the years for me to acknowledge those days that it's kind of like foam pit day, it hasn't changed. Uh, that perspective of the high Alpine for me with skis on is that on certain days it is a big foam pit. And as long as you're patience and your vision doesn't exceed um you know what the safety of that day and the abilities that i have you know it's it's been a fine line of uh, really calculating that and living by it because um you know i love living i love being healthy and i certainly don't want to die and i want to live a long healthy life so um you know to to introduce some of the baseball card stats, you know, I have, <laughs> world, I have world records in, in cliff jumping. Um, biggest cliff I've ever jumped is 220 feet. I've done 10 to 15 cliffs over hundred feet um, and countless, uh, and you know, the 50 to hundred foot range. And then obviously thousands in the 15 under, but you know, for anyone that's ever gone up a, uh, like a platform at the diving facility, that top platform, is super high and it's only 33 feet. Yeah. So something that's rampant in the ski industry is most guys, when they say they jumped a 70 footer, it was probably a 30 footer. <laughs> so when I say, you know, I jumped a hundred foot cliff, it truly was. Cause I, it's one thing that's always bugged me in the industry is guys that jump 40 footers and they say they hit 80 footer. It's like, yeah. bro, 
Like that was definitely only 40 feet. It's like, uh, did you watch the hundred foot wave documentary on Netflix? Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know they do the official measurements now because some of it does become folklore and i mean a lot of your stuff is documented on youtube and people can go watch it it's cliche to ask but obviously there's a calculus that goes into that when you're balancing risk and reward and i'm sure there's a massive i don't know momentum to it or an addictive quality to sort of doing these massive aerials beyond just having your name etched in the Guinness book of world records forever. I mean, how is, uh, how has this evolved as you've sort of like evolved as an, as an athlete and in what ways are you still inspired to, to kind of push yourself as a skier, especially given all the other projects that you have going on? You know, I still just love skiing. I love big airs. Um, and like I said, baseball car stats, I'm attracted to the cliffs because they're beautiful and my relationship with them. And then afterwards are kind of the accolades and the baseball car stats. Uh, But when I'm in the present and I'm really staring down one of these monsters and I'm putting countless hours into studying it, you know, I developed this great relationship and I have this amazing intention, which is to have a profound experience with it. Uh, It's definitely not, you know, dominate my surroundings, dominate the mountains. It's really more like a hyper awareness, uh, being present exercise. And, you know, like I said, I love living and there's never an absence of fear because people are like, Oh, you're fearless. It's like, no, every time I go study one of these cliffs, I have a full cup of fear. And what I'm able to do those is sit with that fear and, you know, filter it. Um, I, I use it to think critically about what I'm doing. Um, whether this cliff is possible or impossible, it, it's definitely scary. That's for sure. But I can use that fear and slowly filter it and start thinking critically about actually, can I do this? Is it humanly possible? And as I start to understand, you know, the geometry and, and the, the angle, the takeoff, the landing, things start to make a lot of sense. And obviously that's a very intense decision to make. Yeah. Um, it's life or death. So for me to come to that kind of a decision, it's a pretty beautiful experience. Like I said, it's an exercise in being present um, and getting really in tune to the point where I can concretely turn that fear 100% into confidence. Um, and by the time I've done that and I'm up on the top and I'm ready to go, I'm supremely relaxed, I'm supremely um, aware, and I'm 100% sure I'm going to be okay. And I know, obviously, when you see, when I see pictures of it afterwards, even I'm like, wow, (laughs) how am I that guy? That is so weird, because that is so crazy. But like I said, when I'm I'm in it, uh, I, I love it. And that's the whole thing is just the chase of it. I still love it. And as I've aged, I still love it. Um, and I think that's been a nice backboard for keeping me humble and grateful on this path, no matter what I'm up to. And baseball yeah. card stats are cool, but I don't, I try not to intertwine much of my like self identity into being a professional skier, uh, the, the cliffs and all of it's so amazing. I'm so grateful and obviously I'm proud of it. Um, but I, I want to have, you know, quite a few things going on in my life so that I'm not so wrapped up and addicted in one thing that I got to have it or, you know, it's fleeting. It's so you've probably seen that be the downfall of some of your contemporaries in the sport where they just need to chase the next biggest thing because their identity is so wrapped up in it. And yeah, uh, yeah. I think that's something that probably a lot of action sports athletes uh, struggle with because your career, your, you know, your shelf life as an athlete is only so yeah, it's limited. So yeah. And I can't blame some people. I think I'm lucky. I think I'm fortunate that I have so many other interests. Well, yeah. I mean, you've been able to build so many things peripheral to that core identity of being a pro athlete that you haven't had to hang your hat on only that. And I want to get into more of that stuff. But this also makes me want to ask you, as we briefly touch on the 100-foot wave and Garrett McNamara just brings into my head, the bifurcation between... It exists in trail running, it exists in surfing, and it exists in skiing to a degree, like the bifurcation between 
competition and sort of the lifestyle element of the sports, right? And I think as each one of those sports began to mature, it de-emphasized the comp- the competitive side of things and became more about, you know, filming in the case of both skiing and surfing and now like the FKT movement in trail running. And I think this goes into what you were saying earlier about the power of storytelling and that uh, being something that is not only immensely inspiring to the general public, but also valuable to brands. Do you have any comments on that bifurcation or that similarity that I've identified between those outdoor sports and maybe how it's fit inside your career? Yeah, I think that as all action sports over the last 20 years have just exploded, like all those storytelling platforms have been evolving like we've talked about. But I also think, um, you know, more money is in action sports than ever. And I think more gifted media types, more gifted storytellers, filmers, photographers have gravitated to the space. And with the immense success of, you know, some of these climbing uh, films that have gone really mainstream in the last few years, uh, it's just these amazing creatives are in the space now. So there's so much more that's out to the general public now that may not ever participate in some of these uh, sports. Whereas 10, 15 years ago, pretty much whoever played that sport or participated in that sport is the same people that consume the media. And now it's just, there's so many platforms for it to be consumed. There's a lot more money in it, whether it's the endemic industry or the media like landscape in itself that's funding these projects. So like I said, I think it's a good point because it is amazing. There is so many gifted storytellers now that you can basically choose any action sport and see amazing cinema, amazing storytelling and amazing, um, you can learn so much about whether it's a rootsy kind of unknown that, you know, some interesting film company wants to highlight some obscure person in the industry. Um, or it's just some of the most famous people that have been around and some of the, the, the personalities that we all know in all these sports, yeah. you can just find it. And it's, it's a pretty cool time to be uh, involved in and then see all that. Yeah. Yeah. It's in some ways it's a lot more relatable than the athlete that is winning every competition. Like, you know, Kelly Slater did back in the day in the world surf league and, you know, like a lot of the trail runners are now, but there's that lifestyle element that is immensely compelling. And so for people who are looking to build their careers, approaching it with the professional attitude, like you started our conversation with, but also, yeah, emphasizing the storytelling element and the lifestyle element, it's just as valuable as the performance element. So let's uh, talk more about your entrepreneur ship journey, because I think this is really interesting and core to who you are. And, you know, it seems to me like your first business venture was probably discreet, right? Yeah, it was. So, so maybe give, give the origin story of that, how that came to be sort of what you identified was missing in the market and what you were trying to service. Uh, so my whole childhood as well, I skateboarded a lot and I really liked the athlete-driven industry that skateboarding uh, for the most part still is. Uh, skiing, I found right when I got way into it, was very much uh, racing and corporate driven. Uh, there was no like athlete ownership or not even a real big push to promote certain athletes in skiing. Um, so. I was like, man, and, and everything had like lightning bolts and racing stripes and flames. It was very, all kind of loud and vibrant and, and kind of, you know, like I said, it was a little, little square. Um, and I was like, where's something plain, just like something simple. And obviously I was in college at the time and I was serving tables at a sports bar in downtown Salt Lake. So I just generated a little bit of money and created discreet. And it was a, you know, life's very casual lifestyle clothing brand. We we emphasized beanies. So I came up with, well, I, I shouldn't say I came up with it, but I brought it to market, which was kind of like the baggy tall reservoir tip beanie. So we introduced that to the market around 2006 or seven. 
And um, that was fun to watch that style explode. Then I saw every other beanie company start to carry that within two years of when we introduced, we called it the Dwayne Eater. Um, so it was cool. I learned, um, you know, at the time I finished college around the same time I started that company, I was just starting to get my professional skin career going. And I just, like we talked about earlier, I saw quite a few of some of the most well-known skiers that were, you know, quote unquote, getting old in the industry and getting kind of dropped by sponsors. Uh, I saw a lot of them really struggling with their next step in life. And just something in me was like note to self, you know, no matter how well things go on this path of a professional skier, you really have to have something else going on um, for your next step in life. So that was kind of, wow. That's pretty profound realization to have when you're in college though, isn't it? I mean, yeah. Usually not till you hit like your early thirties that athletes start to think about that. I I know. I think, you know, I was fortunate to have that perspective and I laugh now looking back at that little moment in time when I was going to school full time. I mean, I was putting everything I had into being a professional skier. I was working close to full time at that sports bar and I was starting to screen. So, I mean, I had like these four full time things going on all at once on a shoestring budget. I didn't even own a computer at the time. I was like borrowing people's laptops or using the work computer at the sports bar and just kind of made it, uh, you know, like a, this is just kind of my, <laughs> anyway, it was really funny, but I was like, man, I got something else going on so that if, and when my, you know, shelf life expires as a skier, I have something else going on. So, you know, I had a great, I had a good feel for product design. I had a good feel for marketing um, you know, I, I figured out supply chain factories in Asia, uh, did all those logistics. I was the sales manager. I did all the, um, accounting for the most part and just all the moving pieces of what you call running a business. Uh, you know, really that was a harsh reality and I learned a lot and I was constantly, um, confronted with things I didn't know the answer to or a major challenge, but I was dedicated to making it all work. So you know, that was like a 13, 14 year project. And I can proudly say I sold discreet in December of 2021. Um, so I could put my full attention on how much I was really loving all the factors that go into producing the Cirque series. Uh, Cause I just found I was a little jaded with some of the things I had to put a lot of time into with running discreet, you know, obviously a retail clothing mm-hmm. brand. Um, I just wasn't in love with a lot of the things that it took to run that company. So uh, I can luckily say I, I really enjoy everything it takes to run uh, and produce the Cirque series, which was great. But the Discreet was such a fun project. We made a lot of great decisions. We I made a lot of bad decisions. But in the end, it was this invaluable experience and this invaluable education. Yeah. How to run a business, uh, literally. So by the time I could combine everything I'd learned from like a the role of producer in the skiing world and marketing and combine that with everything I'd learned about running a business with discrete. So when I had the idea to create Cirque series, I really was intentional and I knew exactly what I was doing. And I saw this gap in the mountain running landscape of what, what, what there wasn't, I thought, and that is exactly what the Cirque series was. And I was at the time, you know, falling in love with mountain running because I got this great dog and found myself <laughs> running Mount Olympus all the time. I shouldn't say running, torture hiking Mount Olympus yeah. like multiple times a week. And so anyway, I just was like, I know exactly what I'm doing because I, I have this great background of being a professional and starting this business. So I know how to do this now. There was no like mystery behind the curtain that I knew I had to confront every day with discreet. This time I was like, I know exactly what I'm doing. I'm going to be intentional and and I'm going to pull it off. So it's been really fun to see everything come to fruition since we started those. So, so interesting. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but thinking back to the early days of the Cirque series, I want you to give that full origin story too, because I think it's, it's also equally fascinating and especially to see how it's evolved and where it's headed into the future, but it seemed like at the beginning that the Cirque series was almost a way to market discreet, right? Like 
you guys were probably slinging a bunch of disc- discreet apparel, hats, beanies, hoodies, etc. at the Cirque Series events. Did, were they always meant to be independent or was the event side of the business sort of meant to bolster that retail side of the business? Um, I don't know. What point did it maybe become clear to you that the Cirque Series was where you wanted to devote more of your time and energy? Well, I can say the true uh, motivation of creating the races were because I really did genuinely fall in love with mountain running. And I genuinely thought that this kind of event was needed in the space. And also one of the major things that we wanted to accomplish with Discreet, since it was such a seasonal brand and we were very winter dominated uh-huh. with our revenue, was that we always needed more revenue in the summer. And that's when like our big factory bills were due. So I'm like, we have to have some kind of revenue in the summer. So that's was also part of the motivating factor of the Cirque series was creating some revenue in the summertime for the firm in general. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So you identified this vacuum, this open space in the event marketplace in a brilliant way. I mean, you clearly identified something that needed to exist and that I think not only is very compelling on its own, but acts as potentially the perfect gateway drug to get people into trail running and to build their interest in it over time. And to make it clear, especially in the U S that you don't need to run a hundred mile race to get into trail running. So to, to what extent were you exposed to trail running at the time that you identified this need? Did you have like a deep understanding of the sport and what was like the light bulb moment where you sort of came to the conclusion that you needed to bring the Cirque series to life? Well, I can say how just a moment ago, like being a gateway drug, it's been really fun for me. I'll just quickly mention, I've seen countless people say their first trail run or their first experience of being on a peak was one of our races. And now they do hundred milers. So it literally yeah. is, like you said, like a very cool gateway uh, for a lot of people that do fall in love with trail running and go on to find that they have talent or interest in longer races, which is cool. Um, but anyway, so yeah, you know, I, I spent most of my summers um, mountain biking, or I'd go to Argentina or Chile and ski for a month plus. Those were, that was kind of how my summers would go. Um, and then I, I mentioned I got this amazing dog, and I took her on a few mountain bike rides, and you know, she loved it. But it was her full on sprinting for. 12, 13 plus miles. And I'm like looking at her, she, she loved it. And I'm like, man, she's not going to walk by the time she turns yeah. seven if I keep doing this. Yeah. So I lived at the time at the trailhead to Mount Olympus and Salt Lake. And if you, I'm sure you've hiked that it's, you know, round trip, maybe six miles and it has 4,000 vert. So yeah. it's, it's straight up, straight down, absolute ass kicker of a hike. And as I kept hiking it, um, my dog's loving it. I'm seeing amazing sunrises or sunsets, the agility on the downhill. Um, it was just interesting. It was a a dynamic mountain adventure. Um, and some of my buddies that did forest firefighting were like, Hey, we see you're doing Olympus a lot. Uh, you can't be a forest firefighter unless you can hike to the stream. That's almost halfway up in in less than a half hour. That's like one of our benchmarks. Okay. I was like, Dude, I, I ski all the time. I'm always bootpacking, skinning. I'm like, I got How this. How hard could it be? Exactly. <laughs> so the next time I go, I just hike as fast as I can. And, you know, I'm absolute capacity the whole way up, red line hiking all the way to the stream. Look at my watch, 31 minutes. <laughs> and I'm like so mad because I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> and so that... I, that was pivotal though. Cause up until then I was hiking and, and it was hard, but until that moment uh, of being like, Whoa, I got to break this 30 minutes. So now I started, you know, doing the kind of grandpa shuffle, which is heroic and, and, and because it is faster than your fastest hiking, even though it looks ridiculous and you're barely quote unquote running, but you are going faster. It does take way more anaerobic capacity, lung capacity, everything. And I just kept getting a little faster and kept 
running a little faster through these zones. I could just tell. And so from this first year getting my dog in the spring through October, November, six, seven months, I went from 31 minutes to 22.51. And even now, God. there's no way I can get to the stream in 22.51. I look, every time I hike it now, I'm always like 28, 29, and I'm absolutely like spitting the white stuff out. <laughs> I'm sure I'm going to be around 25. Nope, 28, 29. I'm like, man, how did I do it so fast? But I was so into it. And like I said, it was a dynamic mountain adventure. I felt like a, a story, like a character in a, in a book, you know, or a yeah. movie. Just so yeah. interesting. I, I, I absolutely fell in love with mountain running. And I try to invite people and they'd be like, I don't run. And I'm like, it's not really I'm running. Though, is it? running. Yeah. <laughs> and anyway, so the next winter goes by and I'm having a great winter, but I found myself and in Salt Lake Valley, even during the winter, frequently, uh, the the snow kind of melts on the benches so you can still go hike to the to the stream easily on yeah. olympus, even in midwinter on, on a lot of days so i was still doing that i'm still in love with olympus i fell in love with you know grandeur peak beacon peak five for horn superior all the peaks i'm like wow i've lived in salt lake and maybe i've hiked a lot of the ones up in the cottonwoods a lot in the winter to ski but all these front bench mountains it's so crazy to me that i haven't even hiked these peaks yet so oh. I, it's just like this full absolute genuine like love affair of falling in love with hiking peaks and i really liked the less than 10 miles two to four thousand vert you know yeah so the next spring comes around my really good buddy's wife she's pretty into running she's done lots of uh she's done speed goat and a whole bunch of other cool races but she was like hey uh we're going down to uh, Southern Utah uh, in like April. There's this mountain running race. Do you want to come? Cause we see that, you know, you're always doing your Olympus stuff. And I'm like, yeah. is there any vert? And she's like, not really. It's in, it's in Southern Utah. And I was like, well, I'm probably good. I'll come, I'll come down and hang out. She's like, well, we already signed you up. So just come down. <laughs> so, <laughs> I go down and you know, at the time I was definitely in really good shape. I get second in it and I had a really good time. And I noticed at the end of the race, we're the only people like back our car up and like put down the tailgate and have a beer and like root people through the finish line. There's absolutely zero production value. Yeah. Uh, there, and I can see all these very interesting young people finishing the race, dying to have something to do. Yeah. No, there's no, there's no scene at all. So they just kind of wait for their friend or just leave immediately. And I'm like, looking at the guys that are throwing the event, there's like four or 500 people there, cost 80 bucks. And I'm like, man, good for these guys. They're, they're pocketing 30, 40 grand. Yeah. And they're here as hell not spending much on this event, but it was beautiful, obviously. So and the wheels got, started turning. Well, if you, turning. Yeah, if you increase the production value, make it more of a cultural thing in addition to the performance element, going back to what we were talking about before, lifestyle plus competition, that's where the really magical life experiences come, don't they? Exactly. And luckily, at the time, I was also a GoPro uh, athlete, and they, uh, you know, have the GoPro mountain games in Vail. Yeah. And they were like, hey, just come and hang out. If there's any events you want to do, just let us know. And I noticed they had like the mountain 10K or 15K or, or whatever it is. I'm like, I'll do that. So I signed up. Also thinking I might podium because I just podium this little race over in Moab. Anyway, I go there. It's like, you know, the Sage Candidates and Joe Gray and all, all, all the fellas, you know. Yeah. And obviously the race starts and I'm just like kind of crushed because I realized I'm actually not even close to being fast. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, who are these freaks? I'm like, this is crazy. But anyway, the production value is amazing. Um, yeah. But the course design failed there was no sense of accomplishment there's no sense of destination we're in this beautiful place i felt like they just ran us up around the aspens and figure eights until we hit the 10k mark and brought us back down through the finish line yeah so again i was like wow another missed opportunity the production value is there but there was no sense of destination there's no sense of accomplishment so that's when i really was like well i'm going to go home and google you know where those events are that that have both of hiking a cool peak and obviously I found all the ultras, 
I found the speed goats. I found the broken arrows. I found um, all the mud runs, color runs, Spartans, relay races, all that stuff, all the mom and pop marathons, 5Ks, 10Ks. And obviously the only thing I could find that was anywhere near what I was looking for was the one up in Seward, uh, Mount Marathon. Mount Marathon, yeah. yeah. Exactly. And I was like, well, they get it. <laughs> but yeah. for the entire lower 48, I was like, there was not a single race. I thought I'd find a bunch in Utah alone. Yeah. And right then I was like, man, I should create like the Wasatch Classics and actually have a race on Olympus. Like first yeah. one up and back down and do a grandeur peak, peak and peak. And that was kind of an idea in the back of my head for a couple of years until I was on this really cool trip in Iceland and we were hiking, obviously everything that we're skiing. And this one day I hike up 2000 feet about, and I beat my crew by 10, 15 minutes. I'm just sitting there watching the sunset on the Arctic ocean. And it's like end of March. And I just have this overwhelming like vision of starting the race series. I'm yes. like, going to do it when I get home. I was just, I never, you never feel, you know, so uh, good than when you're out in the mountains exercising. Yeah. I'm like, this is something that will work. I'm like I fell in love with it. It's just, it's not quote unquote running. And it was just this uh, instinct that I had that I knew uh, more people would fall in love with it and that it, you didn't have to be elite. You didn't have to have to do a hundred miles. Right. So, it's like, it's like that big city half marathon, you know, people want to do it because they want to just challenge themselves, but not absolutely destroy themselves. Like go doing a full marathon or a full hundred miler. And I think the Cirque series really represents that of like, go have a proper adventure, challenge yourself, push yourself, have that sense of destination, that sense of accomplishment, but also, you know, finish and have plenty of time left in the day to whatever, hang out for a couple hours at the finish line, go have lunch and get your chores done in the afternoon. It's a brilliant model. And I, you know, I'm really glad to hear that it has been sort of that first step for people to dip their toes into the water. And I think maybe over time, it becomes kind of a great alternative for people who would otherwise sign up for a big city half marathon. So talk a little bit about the progression over the last couple of years. When was that year, like where the first Cirque series race happen and, and like maybe just paint the picture of how that's progressed now in the last couple of years and how you've expanded. It. So first year that we had races was 2015. And so obviously that was March when I made that decision. Our first race was, you know, four or five months later, August 6th at Alta Utah. Mm -hmm. And we also produced, uh, three more races that, uh, late summer, fall in Crested Butte, Deer Valley and Snowbird. So we did four races out of the gate. And it was interesting because my vision of what I wanted the races to be, uh, the type of people that show up, uh, the number of people and the atmosphere, um, you know, to an extent, we, we definitely had the right vibe right out of the gate. And now, you know, seven years later, we're at my vision, which is really exciting for me because, you know, when I really got into that space, obviously, <laughs> you know, as an entrepreneur, um, it was opening up a whole another can of worms of like event production slash in the running space, which is obviously a very, uh, you know, that's, there's a lot of competition. It's pretty saturated. Um, and obviously a lot of people told me they're like, your races are too short. They're not going to work. Like you can't be asking for these types of registration fees for the short of a race. And I was like, well, you don't get it. <laughs> Even though yeah. it's someone that has been doing running races for maybe 30 or 40 years that are telling me this, but I'm just like, you'll see. But I think that's what it takes to be to some extent, a professional athlete and an entrepreneur, because Obviously I've asked and seeked sponsorship and heard hundreds of no's, but you can't let some company that doesn't want to sponsor you at that moment, define your own like self-confidence or your own um, idea of what your abilities are, what you think you can accomplish. The so same thing when I got out of the gate with these running races, 
and realized it was a whole nother can of worms. I just stuck to my guns of like, I really think this is something that a lot of people will enjoy and it doesn't exist. So I'm, I'm actually trying to pioneer this whole idea. And I, and I know because by experience, I lived it for the past two or three years. I absolutely fell in love with exactly what I'm creating. And yeah. I, I, I was an M my number one fan. Cause I, I still race every single race I've produced. And every time I get in the start line, I'm like really excited. Cause I'm like, this is super fun for me. So I, I want to be able to sample my own product, to yeah. some, you know, and obviously when I do my own races, it's, you know, I'm making sure all the course marking that we set up is still intact. I'm making sure the EMTs and the volunteers are all where they should be. The aid stations look great and just everything's, you know, it's, it's very much an audit. You yeah. Know, I'm enjoying myself. Just, Quality control. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> but, um, I will say that the vision, nothing has changed. It's just like a matter of, you know, finding, um, kind of the fun of expanding the races from just Utah and Colorado that first year to we added Alaska the next year. So this will be our fifth year doing a race in Alieska. And that race is amazing because I was just watching somebody, like the highlight, the little highlight uh, video that you have on the website with Joe Grant, you guys sampling the course. It looks like a nasty, nasty course up there in AK. Yeah, it's it looks like, you know, Mount Marathon sort of. Oh, you know, just and it's fun because the same type. This, this, there's a huge overlap of uh, the people that come out for both of those races, yeah. and so the you know Alaskan mountain running community um, is as real deal as it gets. So I've had to obviously pass through all the appropriate <laughs> gates of approval up there to be endorsed by their community and embraced by them. And you know, I think we do things right, and we have been embraced. We're part of their Grand Prix. Uh, series that uh, combines a bunch of about eight or nine of uh, you know all hundred Alaskan mountain races. Yeah, cool. So it's fun to be included in that, and just to get to know all the personalities up there because there's a lot of very cool people up there, and the mountains are real deal. I think the first time we went up there, you know, the Alaska Mountain Running Club guys that produce or own a bunch of the other events up there, and like Race Direct, Mount Marathon, and all that they met us our first day up on the hill to go inspect the course. Cause I think they were like, who are these jokers from the lower 48? Yeah. They don't get it. Yeah. Up there and produce a race on this gnarly of terrain. Cause that Alieska course truly has some no fall zones. Yeah. So it was fun to, you know, develop a genuine friendship with those types and they gave the whole relationship space and like, understood what I was trying to do and felt me out. And, and I think we have a nice respect for each other. And I think they really appreciate and uh, respect what we're doing and how we do it. So it's, it's been fun because producing events are interesting because there's always so many logistics from the production side from what we need to do, but then you're going into a space, you know, where you need to work and be cohesive with a with another set of personalities that are also you know interested in everyone's well being and in health and yeah. trying to produce these really cool world class events that are you know in dangerous terrain so you know it's like a very interesting dynamic and personality management when you go from event to event because obviously Cirque Series is pretty unique that we are like truly a series that goes to mm -hmm. seven different locations around the world and. Um, I think that's part of the fun for me is I enjoy that challenge. And and from that amazing friendships, I can yeah. go and you know, whether it's the community or the people that represent the mountain, um, you know, all these challenges ultimately become these amazing sources of strength um, and producing events is tricky. So it's really fun to put all that energy and um, commitment to something that not only pays off when you see so many people enjoying themselves, from so many walks of life, you know, whether it's, I've, you know, our ages span from seven to 82, you know, in the gate with Joe Gray. And it's crazy that that big of a spectrum. <laughs> That's so cool. Makes so, sense. This is, this is it. I mean, it's in hindsight, it feels so obvious, right? Like just an elevated 
mountain running experience that has that sense of destination and accomplishment. And when you finish and you can trade some war stories at the finish line and sort of celebrate the trail culture a little bit and, you know, sort of have that be an auxiliary, um, you know, interaction with the sport to these 50 mile or hundred K hundred mile races as well. It just seems so obvious. At what point did it start to become clear that it was kind of catching on and that your vision was like, you weren't crazy. And I know obviously you've developed partnerships with on running and backcountry.com. It looks like, and I freaking love the interactive maps you guys have on the website from on X, like talk about that professional side of the Cirque series and how that all started to materialize. And at what point people started to recognize that your vision had legs. Well, I think from the very first race at Alta, um, we had some, you know, the major personalities of the, you know, Wasatch mountain running community came out for the event, um, like Craig Lloyd and the DeRay brothers and Zach Marion and, um, all these guys afterwards came up to me and they were just like, dude, so you, you're so nailing it. Like, yeah. please, please keep doing this. This is what we need, not only in Utah, but for trail running in general, this is amazing. So it was cool to hear that affirmation from those guys because <clears throat> I really respect uh, mountain runners. I think, you know, you guys are superheroes to me um, because you know, I finish middle of the pack usually at these races and I absolutely love what I do. I love the adventure. I love traveling through the mountains and obviously to see you guys, you know, already getting up on the summit when I'm still working away the side of the, the, the shoulder and just to see how fast you guys are is it's so inspiring slash, you know, <laughs> frustrating because <laughs> it, it's impossible. You guys are so impossibly fast. So I think to have a race where, you know, a bro like me can really love it. Um, along with, you know, a grandpa type in that age bracket, and then it still be enough of a challenge that, you know, professionals want to show up that I've always placed a lot of emphasis on having good prize money. And a big part of that environment, when you finish a race, you know, is having really cool brands involved so that we can make uh, for me, again, going back to skiing, when you're done with a day of skiing, opre is just as important. You it's so to, true. Yeah, you want to, yes. to talk about the day, celebrate the day. So I try to, I've, I've put just as much emphasis into the after race environment as the race itself. Because um, I want people to celebrate their adventure. Um and it's been fun to see that come together as well. And, and a big part of my ability to bring in, you know, usually we have around 30 to 40 brands that are there activating. And it's, I think just because from, again, all the, you know, role of producer and sponsorship language I've learned as a skier, I know how to go to the brands and be like, hey, here's an awesome opportunity to, you know, get plugged in and, and have this be a big win-win. So I think I can just, you know, pretty, uh, you know, two plus two equals four kind of a thing. It's like, let's all get together and hang out and have a good time. Yeah. It's pretty easy for sponsors to be like, yeah, definitely. Let's do it. Game yeah. on. I'm like, sweet, let's go. <laughs> well, it's so cool what you've created. And I so I still have never been to one of your races, but I, I so want to. And I know the season is fast approaching. So let's use this as an opportunity to sort of talk about what's coming up this year. Um, you know, it seems like the, the first race is coming up in Brighton, Utah in a couple of weeks. And it seems like this is the first year that you're expanding into the European market. So maybe just give us a quick tease as to what you're looking forward to for this summer Cirque series. Well, yeah, kicking off July 16th, first race of the year, Brighton. Um, and then we're hitting some of the, the usual spots. Our second race is July 30th, Alieska. And then we come back to Utah, August 6th for Snowbird. Um, and then a couple of weeks later, August 20th is Alta. And last year was the first year we produced a race at Grand Targhee. So we have that Wyoming. race. Uh, yep. Second year is August 27th in 
for anyone that's been to Grand Targhee, as you know, you go up Mary's and you feel like you can just reach out and touch the Grand. It's like right there. It's one of the coolest views, I think, in the lower 48. Yeah, um, I'm looking at the race map right now. It looks just absolutely amazing. It's bonkers. Yeah. Um, so we're very happy to have the race at Targi. Um, and September 10th, a base in Colorado, which, you know, going up Little Lenawee, which is about 12.9. So you get up pretty high on that race. Yeah. Um, and a basin is just this really cool independent resort that is really embraced by, you know, I guess, Colorado. Yeah. It's sort of like one of the locals ski resorts for people who live on the front range in Summit County and there in Colorado. So super honored to have the working relationship with them. And then closing out the season first, first time we're going over to produce a race in Switzerland at Engelberg, which I'm really excited about. Well, I actually am going to a wedding in Engelberg like two weeks after your race. So I'm thinking about maybe that'll be my introduction to Cirque Series racing. Um, be cool. That'd be very cool. Go check it out. So, you know, maybe as we start to wind down, I'd love to hear if you, to what extent you want to reveal, you know, maybe some of your future plans. To me, I think one of the major opportunities for you that I think would also be massively valuable for the sport is to, introduce, you know, more kind of like broadcasting of this type of event, because I think the format is such that it's dramatic, it's exciting, the visuals, the landscapes are brilliant. And because it's not a hundred miles, people don't have to tune in for 20 to 30 hours to get, you know, an inspiring viewing experience. They can watch the race over the course of an hour or two hours and then get on with their day. And then obviously you could cut things up and put them on social, which you already do obviously, but, um, you know, to what extent are you excited about, you know, potentially introducing more media, maybe broadcasting, things like that? You know, I think, um, the big scheme of things, I'm really happy with the seven races that we're producing and I think just optimizing the seven that we have is probably like my two to three year goal. Um, every year I have like target expansion regions that I really, really want to add more races. And I've gone to, you know, out East, I've gone out up in the Northwest and, and Tahoe and places like this to really critically look at some key target expansion areas. But at the end of the day, like we still have a lot of uh, targets I want to hit with the races right now. Like, you know, we can drop registration and we're selling out our races, but it's typically just a couple of weeks before each race. So mm -hmm. to me, I'm like, once we're starting to sell out races, like a month or two in advance, uh, I think to me, that's when we're in a position that we can expand comfortably because I yeah. still want to optimize our workflow, uh, you know, all the production um, efficiencies. Uh, so there's still a lot of stuff I want to do on my end and producing seven races, uh, still a pretty, you know, gigantic um, task, but there's still enough breathing room in the summer that my crew and myself, we still feel like we have a summer. Um, and obviously besides optimizing those efficiencies, um, and, and, you know, getting that kind of more curb appeal that we're selling out even quicker. Um, it's just so I can plan ahead financially to really be able to um, target what these new opportunities are, which like you mentioned is, you know, what exactly can we pull off on the, um, on the broadcast side? And like, who can we reach out to that could be a good prod broadcast partner and, and how can we afford that? And those kind of things. Cause I know from, like you said, where we're going, the visuals alone, are enough uh, criteria to have compelling TV, but then you add in the, the professionals that are there, who they are, and then some of the beginners, I've seen people come and do our races that are complete beginners and now they have sponsors. I've seen um, people come that, you know, maybe it's like a goal that they've never been on a summit before and they're really determined. Yeah. Um, and, they might, and they might even finish last, but they do it and it's incredible. And I love those types of personalities and those kind of stories because I think, you know, the, the denominator with Cirque Series is that we're all inclusive. It's a very uh, friendly environment for all abilities. Yeah. Uh, and I think that for the pros, it's kind of fun for them because 
I think for the most part, they're doing events where they're around their peers, you know, and suddenly they're at an event where they have a ton of people fanning out on them. Uh, I can tell it's pretty special for those pros to have that podium experience, hanging out in the vendor village experience and being approached by so many people that are genuine fans instead of just their peers, you know, yeah. so I think for them it's also quite fun. Um, so I think it's just really uh, not rushing, not getting ahead, uh, uh, you know, of what we're trying to pull off. Cause I think there's still a lot of things I want to uh, get better at right now. Um, and I think that, like I said, there's, I definitely want to go out East. I definitely want to go Northwest. I want to go to New Mexico. Are you, are you kidding? I, I'd love to have 20 races, you know? Yeah. But, I think, I think there's room for it. I mean, already. there is, there the, really the, is. The challenge for you is, yeah, that exactly that, not trying to do too much too quickly. And I think as an entrepreneur, oftentimes that's a difficult thing to manage and maybe something that you learn from your days doing discreet um, is to ease off the gas pedal sometimes and find those efficiencies before expanding too quickly. Exactly. So even this year, deciding to expand a, to Europe was obviously a big decision. Um, but I'm really glad that we went through with it. And Engelberg is one of my favorite places to ski. And I know a lot of people in that community and I, you know, definitely had a lot of heavy lifting done with a lot of help. Um, so, you know, that's a lot of these community ties that I've had for a decade plus as a skier over there. And it's been three years in the making. So to finally get all these green lights on all these hurdles we needed to clear uh, a big decision. So I was already pretty content with a six that we had and just be, being like, all right, let's do, let's get, cause we have the opportunity. We, we cleared the hurdles. Let's do it. So yeah. we're already in a position that adding on Engelberg is already a pretty gigantic decision, um, but super fun. And now it's really neat to say that we're an international race series and, it's nice to have, again, like that feather in the cap or some more baseball card stats. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Cool. Well, Julian, super, super fun to get to know you and chat a little bit. I'm so impressed with the Cirque series. And like I said, I've never been, but just like watching from afar what you've built, I think it's absolutely filling a hole in the community. And I just think it's also fascinating and fun that it was started by a pro skier, you know, and, and that you had that vision and brought it into, into our sport and, and recognized and filled that gap. Maybe last question as we sign off is, you know, obviously a lot of people are interested in how they build a career within the outdoor and action sport industry. Maybe what are some pieces of advice that you've gleaned along the way earlier in the conversation, you alluded to maybe some mistakes that you've made that turned out to be great learning experiences. Any words of wisdom to the audience who may be looking to build a life and a career in the outdoor industry, things that you've learned along the way? I would just say, again, it's, it's uh, kind of just being thick skinned um, and willing to, you know, burn your tires because, you know, if someone comes to a surf series race and they see 40 sponsors, and that's really amazing, but you know, that probably just for the 40 that are there were 300, 400 plus emails facilitated. And for the 2000 plus emails facilitated for the ones that aren't there. Yeah. And that goes for finding sponsors. Um, there's gonna be maybe a tiny percent that it actually works out with. So I think a lot of people, once they start getting hit with some no's and some challenging um, outcomes that weren't part of their, their roadmap, um, and I think it's just that. I think I mentioned earlier, like the your vision can't exceed your skills. I think it's the same thing with the professional side is you, you, you should be able to forecast and script, but, you know, not to the point where your expectations um, become your plan you know, because you're going to be let down a lot and you need to just expect that really. If you want to create expectations, it's that yeah. there's going to be a lot of challenges or a lot of roadblocks, um, but you just need to fit, take it um, and just not take things personally. And for the most 
things that most often isn't personal. It's just a resource, a bandwidth, and you, you don't dwell on it. You get good at making decisions and you do it quickly and you keep moving, you know, keep, yeah. keep spinning the tires. <laughs> yeah. I've been doing nothing over the past year and a half, but listening to podcasts about building businesses, building media companies specifically, and listening to one recently about, you know, what things successful businesses had in common. And it was basically just that they didn't quit. It's the ones that just keep moving forward that uh, ultimately, you know, can look back and be proud of what they've created. And obviously it's not without an avalanche and never ending stream of challenges, but. Well, uh, I'd love some time to be able to flip this around and interview you. Cause I think uh, <laughs> what you've done obviously as an athlete and um you know, building these interesting storytelling platforms and uh, you as a personality as well. I think it's uh, very fascinating. And just for me, being from the ski industry and coming into the mountain running space and producing these events, it's been awesome for the most part to be welcomed. And, and I've tried to understand who exists. Yeah. Uh, I try to high five as many people as I can and just realize we're all one big happy family uh, and that we can all help each other out. So thanks for um, endorsing what I'm trying to do. And I really appreciate it. And I think it's amazing everything you're pulling off as well. My man. Well, thanks so much, Julian. And uh, yeah, I look forward to to watching from afar what you guys put together this summer. I hope it's a really successful season of the Cirque series. I'll make sure to put a bunch of links in the show notes so people can go learn more about the races that you put on and yeah, uh, look forward to following all of it going forward into the future. And I hope it, I really am confident that this is going to be an important piece of our sport in the long term of just introducing more people to the spirit, culture, majesty of mountain running and a big thank you to you and the team for putting it together. You bet, man. Well, I look forward to seeing you at one of the races someday. And uh, thanks again, man. Great to be on the show.